What doesn't want to work? No, it's fine. All right. Um, how about a video? We need something to. I blame Mary. This is called Five Idiots. talked about um, weight volume calculations and using the universal drug calculation. You need to talk about ratio solutions because they're a little bit different. Talk about tonicity. Talk about um, another formula, of course, because there's no, no math in respiratory, uh, where we're dealing with um, having two different concentrations of solutions, and I need to, or I have, well, you'll see, and in pediatric. So here's an order perhaps that we get, if you ever see this order, run quickly in the other direction because isoprol is uh, extreme. It's an old bronchodilator, but it's been out of, uh, there's better drugs to use, let's, let's, let's put it that way. Where's my, uh, all right. Isoprol 5 milligrams of a 1 to 100 solution. So 1 to 100 is a ratio that we have there. And I'm going to mix in 2, liters, two milliliters of normal saline, small volume nebulizer, every four hours. So I'm not given a concentration like I was previously, where I had a 5% solution or 2.25% solution. Here I have a ratio. The ratio is, again, the concentration is a weight and volume relationship. And the important thing to remember is that one gram in some amount of milliliters of solution. So if I say I have a 1 to 100, that means I have one gram in the 100 milliliters. 1 to 200 is one gram in 200 milliliters. And from there, we can do the conversion to be able to get to the desired amount of, um, that, we, uh, that we want to be able to use in our there we go. So if I have a 1 to 100, that means I have 1 gram in 100 milliliters or 1,000 milligrams in 100 milliliters or 10 milligrams in 1 milliliter. So this is basically reducing as, as we're going. From there, then, we can plug it into our weight volume formula and solve for it. All we're doing is the, the, is the fact that we have a ratio as opposed to a, a, a percent. So 1 to 200 means I have 1 gram in 200 milliliters, or, one, or 0.5 grams in 100 milliliters. You see what I did there? I just divided both the 1 and the 200 by... Um, two. So that would be a 0.5 percent solution, 1,000 milligrams, 200 milliliters, 
just work out the same. A ratio, uh, ratio of 1 to 1,000 means they have 1 gram in 1,000 milliliters, or 0.1 grams in 100 milliliters. Going back to our prior uh, lecture, we knew that that's a 0.1% solution. You can also express it as 1,000 milligrams per 1,000 milliliters, or 1 milligram per milliliter in the process. There's another example, 1 to 400. I have a 0.25% solution. can also look at this as not 1,000 milligrams. How about, uh, yeah, 1,000 milligrams per 400 milliliters. That's right. So ratios are always so many grams per so many milliliters. So if this is the, con uh, the order there of a 1 to 100 solution, that 1 to 100 means 1 gram in 100 milliliters or 1,000 milligrams in 100 milliliters, or as we said, 10 milligrams per milliliter. I can go ahead and plug this into my formula I did previously, that weight-volume relationship, 1,000 milligrams per, per 100 milliliters, which is what we have here, and I want 5 milligrams because that's what the order is for. Do my math as far as setting it up, cross-multiplying, and I end up with a half a milliliter is the amount I need to draw up to be able to yield this uh, five, five milligrams of drug. Like I care. You need to. Now you're going to say you want compassion. I'll just take a picture and that's totally fine. I just <laughs> Yes. This is the weight volume relationship where I plugged in the value that I have on the dosage on hand. That's what we're always trying to figure out. How much do I have on hand? Um, based upon this, I can set up a ratio for the small amount that I need. Okay? We good? You took a picture, okay. You can also go and, using the universal drug e calculation, convert that ratio to a percentage. A 1 to 100 solution means that I have 1 divided by 100, which is a 0.01. If I do 1 divided by 100, it comes out to 0 0.01, or a 1% solution. It's one part in... in uh, 100. Once I have it as a percentage, that ratio expressed as a percentage, then I can plug it into the universal drug calculation. So I have a 1 to 100 solution. I want 5 milligrams of isoprel. I'm going to go ahead and convert that 1 to 100 to a percentage, 1%, and plug it into my number of milliliters times the, n times the number of the percent times 10 is equal to the number of milligrams. Setting it up this way, I end up having 1 times 10, yielding 10. Divide both sides by 10, so I end up with 5 over 10, or 0.5 milliliters. Both answers come out the same, depending upon what you feel comfortable with. To some people, the weight-volume relationship makes sense, setting it up as two ratios and going ahead and doing the math. For most of us, I think this is the more comfortable route to go. Both will give you the same answer. In fact, if you want to double check your answer, you can do both ways. I'm thinking that. Milliliters, yes, I apologize. We good? And there are some problems that are out there that you can do. And I think I have them on a, a spreadsheet set up for, for, the, for this to be able to do it also. Okay, let's change gears a little bit and talk about what goes on in solution. Uh, whenever a solute is placed into a solvent, solute being, again, the vodka, solvent being the orange juice as you're making yourself a screwdriver, 
that solute ends up ex exerting a pressure. And there's two different kind of pressure gradients that you probably have been exposed to, we just didn't really talk about. First of all, there's diffusion, which is the passive movement from a high concentration to a lower concentration. And then there's an osmotic pressure due to osmosis, where osmosis is the movement of water from an area of low concentration to an area of high concentration. In both cases, the, uh, the goal is equilibration between the two areas. So let's look a little bit more in depth at those. Here's diffusion, where a solute is moving across a semipermeable membrane until they're balanced on either side. They're in equilibrium. There's equal amounts of solute on one side as on the other side. That's passive diffusion, especially when we're moving through a semipermeable membrane when it's in solution. Okay. So over time, it left on its own, if there's a semipermeable membrane separating two chambers, the number of particles on one side and the number of particles on the other side will, equ will eventually be the same. That's just passive diffusion. Osmosis is where I have different concentrations on either side. There's more solute on the left-hand side than on the right-hand side. Well, the solutes in this case can't move across this membrane for whatever reason, but water can. What will end up happening is water will move from the right side over to the left side. The bottom line is that the concentration between the left side and the right side will be the same, even though the volume of water will not necessarily be. Does that make sense? Okay. Diffusion is equilibration just because a particle itself can move across a semipermeable membrane. Sometimes the membrane is impermeable to solutes, but it is permeable to water. So let's say the concentration here was 40% and the concentration here was 20, 25%. Fair? Water will move from here and go over to here until they're both, let's say, 36%. The concentrations are equal. The, how much water is in each area is not. The one on the right has actually gone down because water has left and gone to the left, gone to the left-hand side. But the concentration of particles is exactly the same. Because remember, concentration deals with how much solute you have in relationship to how much volume you have, how much solvent you have. Still no. I don't know because the dots are confusing me. Like, because I'm thinking if the percentage the dots have to be the same. They don't have, that's what I'm saying. The number of dots won't be the same because dots can't move across that membrane. Okay. So what's going to move is water until it's the same concentration that is, in, that is on equal sides. Is this only... Ratio? Like ratio of solvent to water? Correct. Okay. The, the, amount of, the amount of vodka you have for the, for the amount of orange juice. If I add more orange juice to the left-hand side, which is what I'm doing when I'm shifting that over, I'm actually making that, even though there's more particles of it there, it's weaker in a sense because it's got more, it's got more stuff mixed in with it. Why, why is it when I bring up alcohol, it all makes sense? <laughs> that is exactly correct. With osmosis, water is moving. With diffusion, particles are moving. So when you put Egan under your pillow to study at night, it's diffusion of the particles from Egan into your brain. It's not osmosis. If it was osmosis, you'd be wetting the bed. <laughs> Got it? Okay, this is this get, get a little bit cloudy, so I want to make sure we, that we got it. All right. Um, and this is also why those larger molecular weight particles pull uh, fluid across to it. What's drawing the water from the right side to the left side is not only the concentration being higher, 
sometimes even just the particles themselves. Um, if you remember back, you may have covered in A&P Starling's Law of the Capillary, where you ended up having uh, hydrostatic pressure and, and, and osmotic pressure or arachotic pressure. Does that vaguely ring a bell? Mm, I'm guessing no. Kind of sounds sort of familiar. Um, but there is different forces acting to shift fluid across the membrane. For right now, diffusion, passive movement of the solute, osmosis, passive movement of the solvent, specifically water. So here is again, you can see the concentrations are in uh, What is this showing? <laughs> so you can figure out all one. Well, the bottom one makes sense. They have a different in concentrations between the two. I'm not sure what the top one is trying to show. <laughs> yeah, really. You see this part here? Difference in concentrations membrane that's permeable to the water, whatever the solvent is, now I end up moving, even though there's more particles here than there is here, the concentrations by the end are the same. This is what actually happens also within the cell. If I have a difference in concentration outside the cell than I do inside the cell, water will attempt to move out of the cell and move into the solution to dilute it down so the concentrations become the same. In the process, the, sh the shell, the cell actually shrinks because it's attempting to try and um, equilibrate the two concentrations that are present. We're going to call this tonicity. And it's basically how close the concentration of a fluid is to that of the body. The body has a natural concentration of 0.9% uh, saline. So in other words, there's, well, that's called normal saline. Whenever we use the term normal saline, it's 0.9%. That's what we have with, within our bodies. If I have a situation where I have a tonicity higher than 0.9%, say 2%, 3% solution, and I apply that to the cells, the cells are going to attempt to equilibrate with that 2% solution by moving water out of the cell into the solution. In that sense, the cell shrinks. We call that crenation. Inversely, if I use, say, a 0.45% solution, a hypotonic solution, the water now, or the uh, concentration of salt now inside that solution is less than what is in the cell, and water will move out of the solution into the cell to try and equilibrate the concentrations. Well, the problem is, is that water now moving into the cell is going to make that swell, that cell swell and burst. We call that hemolysis. We can do this through through an IV mixture. We can also do this by an inhalation of a concentration of solution. So I can have an IV being placed where I end up having the fluid being 3% saline as opposed to 0.9. I have a hypertonic saline as opposed to an isotonic. I can inhale a, a saline mixture of 3% and the airways will have exactly the same effect. It'll pull fluid out of the cell into the airway or pull 
in this case, pull fluid out of the cell into the vasculature. Why would I want to do that? Maybe there's a lot of fluid that's accumulated either inside the cell or in the interstitial space and I want to pull it back into the vasculature. Giving a hypertonic saline will pull that fluid back. Say I want to create more mucus. It's a sick thought, but there are times where we want to have an increase in what we call bronchorrhea, basically amount of secretions that are there. I can do that by giving a hypertonic saline. It pulls fluid out of the cells that surround the airway into the airway itself to dilute that hypertonic saline down. Now, over time, if we don't, if you're not careful, you can actually pull enough fluid off that, you're, that the cell collapses, which obviously is not what we want to do. But if I want to increase the amount of mucus that is that is present, a hypertonic inhalation will end up doing that. Hypotonic, exactly the opposite. Because its tonicity is less than what's inside the cell, fluid is going to move from this solution that we have into the um, cell, and eventually the cell will explode, if not allowed to be stopped. Got the distinction between hypertonic and hypotonic? Thank you for lying to me. Now, what happens if I say have a 10% solution? That's what the bottle I have is a 10% solution, but I only want to deliver a 5% solution. We dilute it. How much do we dilute it? Bingo! There's a formula for that. Really? So say I have something that's too strong and I need to dilute it down. Somebody made me a screwdriver and it's way too... I can taste the vodka. No, that's not <laughs> I can add more orange juice to make that concentration less to dilute it down. Question is how much do I need to add? Now notice, adding more solvent does not change the amount of solute. You still have the same amount of vodka when I'm adding orange juice. It's just that it's more dilute. I'm changing the concentration. But the amount of medication that is there, whether I use that half milligram of albuterol with two milliliters or 10 milliliters, it's still the same amount of drug which is present there. Okay. I do change the concentration, and in doing so, then also change the tonicity and the osmotic pressure. They'll both go down with it. So here's the example that you might see on a test, say, well, not, not Monday. Yeah. Or tomorrow, by the way. You guys have the option of taking it tomorrow. Yeah, right. <laughs> I have 10 milliliters of a 20% solution. I only need a 10%. So you set this up as concentration one, volume one, concentration two, volume two. I have 20% and I have 10 milliliters. I want a 10%. The question is, how much do I need to add to that? So I go ahead and do my math and I find that it's 20 cc's. What that means this is the ending volume. How much do I need to add to get to my desired concentration? What is my ending volume? 20 milliliters, right? How much should I start with? So how much do I need to add? Woo-hoo-hoo! That's exactly correct. Now be careful on this. This is the ending volume. This is not the amount that I need to add. 
Now that rat bastard could ask the question one of two ways. How much do you need to add? What is the ending volume? So be careful how the question's worded. That's a small hint. Let's say I have 20 cc's of a 0.9% solution and I need a 0.3% solution. How much volume do I need to add? Doing the math there, my ending volume is 60. Since I started with 20, I have to add 40. Everybody follow that logic with that. And I could do it, by the way, going the opposite direction, saying I have 20 cc's of a 10% of a solution, and I now have uh, 60 cc's at the end. How, what, what is the concentration change? So I'm solving for V2 here. I could easy, just as easily solve for C2, depending upon how the question is worded. Okay. So when you add more solvent to a medication, We'd be giving more medication. No. When you add more solvent, what happens to the concentration, the, the tonicity? It goes down. When you add more solvent, what happens to the time the therapy takes? It's going to take longer. Yeah. Same amount of drug is just going to take twice as long to nebulize, or however long. Make sense? Yeah. Sure, Rick, whatever you say. You oh, God. Huh? You wouldn't ask us how long it would take, though. No. You know. 20 questions on the next test, all on that. <laughs> all right. Um, there's multiple ways that we can use to determine the dosage for pediatric patients compared to adult patients. Um, in some cases, the dosages have been already created for us because through testing, they, 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 they say that this is the dosage range for pediatrics, this is the dosage range for adults. You probably have seen this if you looked at cough medicine for your kids. You know, up to this age, use this amount, this age, use this amount, blah, blah, blah. Well, there's multiple ways that we can end up doing, uh, doing the comparison one using a Dubois nomogram, one using uh, Freed's rule, uh, which is m specifically for infants under a year, Young's rule using for uh, one, to two, uh, one to 12 years of age. Uh, we're going to focus on Clark's. The only one I want you to pay attention to is Clark's, because that's really the one I think that's probably used the most uh, in most pediatric areas. And it basically says, what is the child's weight in pounds? Divide that by 150 because, you know, that's the average weight of every adult. And then multiply by the adult dosage. I'll give you an example. So let's say I have an adult dose, 20 milligrams. That's what we would administer to you and I of this drug. I have a 15-pound uh, child. How much do I need to administer? Well, first I got to, what's that? Okay. When you answer yourself, then we know we got real, real, real issues. I take the child's weight, 15, divide it by 150, that's our standard, and multiply it by 20. So this ends up being two milligrams. 15 times two is 300 divided by 150 is two. So using Clark's rule, we would determine that this is a two milligram would be an equivalent dose for a 15 pound child, given that it's a 20, gram, 20 milligram dose for an adult. And there's all kind of problems you can end up finding on that. There's some in Cybersome. Um, there actually is some in Egan, and I got some self-assessments for you there. Yes. And we will stop there. <laughs>